chapter 36. At first, Papa didn't even look like Papa. His bald head was wrapped round and round with bandages. He had wires and tubes and machines to help him do everything, and his face was pale and sagging. Every one of us found another person's hand to hold as we stepped closer to Papa's bed. He had a tube in one arm and a blood pressure cuff wrapped around the other. Wires and sensors were attached to him everywhere, and his pointing finger looked like it had a big fat clothespin on it. Papa's arms rested outside his blankets. His hands lay palms up like he was reaching out for help. I felt as though I'd forgotten how to breathe. The normal, simple act of fill filling and emptying my lungs became the hardest thing I'd ever had to do. I was afraid to swallow, knowing that it would unleash the flood of tears that burned behind my eyes. Grandpa Bamba struggled with the lid of the jar in his old hands, his knobby fingers unable to get a good, strong grip as he tried to open it. Tenderly, Rocket took the jar from Grandpa and gently tapped the lid against the bedside table once or twice. Then he loosened the lid a half of a turn, and Mama and Papa's never-ending love song spilled loudly into the room. Mama took the jar from Rocket, tightening the lid a quarter turn to lower the volume and keep the nurses from rushing in to shush us, but her hands trembled as she did it. I rubbed my knuckles gently against Papa's jaw, feeling the scratchy stubble of his unshaven chin. Then I dropped my hand to his arm. I ran my shaking hand lightly down Papa's arm and stopped with one finger pressed against the inside of his wrist, as though checking for a pulse. In that moment, I couldn't help remembering the homeless man by the dumpster behind the Emerald Truck Stop diner and lounge. That man had been asleep, too. Asleep and totally alone. Totally hopeless. He'd had no one to play songs for him, no one to listen, no one to care. But Papa had all of us, and we would never let him go. Mibs, said Fish, hardly loud enough for me to hear. I looked up at my brother, who tapped his own forearm meaningly, mean, meaningfully, then nodded at Papa. Miss Mermaid, Mibs, he whispered. What about Miss Mermaid? Samson looked at me then, too, his dark eyes round. I could not believe that I'd forgotten. How could I forget about Papa's faded navy tattoo? How could I have forgotten Miss Mermaid? Gently, careful not to bump any important tubes or wires, I turned Papa's arm around. There she was, wrapped around her anchor, anchor, winking beneath the hair on Papa's arm. But to my distress, even Papa's tattoo looked belly up and lifeless, like that long-haired mermaid had dodged a shipwreck to get washed up on dry land. I listened hard for that mermaid's voice inside my head. I traced her long green tail with the tip of my finger. Then I closed my eyes tight and tried to hear what Papa might be thinking, what Papa might be feeling, what Papa might be dreaming or wishing or knowing. I listened and listened and listened, but there was nothing. No voices in my head, no Papa at all. I heard the rasp of metal against glass as fish, face scrunched up against his tears, reached out to close the lid all the way on Grandpa, Grandma Dollop's jar stopping short the never-ending love song. I wasn't sure if he closed the jar to help me hear Papa or to keep all of our hearts from tearing into pieces. Without that song, so much stillness filled the room that I felt as broken and dark as all of Rocket's busted light bulbs. I realized that Fish and Samson were still looking at me, hardly breathing. They were watching me listen. They wanted to know what I could hear, wanted to know what Miss Mermaid had to say about Papa and when he was planning on waking up. Mama and Rocket didn't know yet about me and ink and skin and feelings and thoughts and listening, and maybe it wasn't the best time to be telling them, since what I was not hearing couldn't be good, couldn't be good at all. Fish and Samson knew, they knew, and they were looking to me to learn what they could. I shook my head slowly. Without even a gust or a breeze, Fish turned his back on me and walked out of the room. Fish? Concerned, Mama followed Fish out into the hall taking Gypsy with her as she left to make sure that Fish was all right. Rocket tried to comfort Samson, but Samson just stood by Papa's bed like a statue. It was impossible to believe that an entire room filled with special Beaumont know-how could do nothing to help our Papa. All I could do was listen uselessly, but listen, I did. I listened until my ears rang with all the soft beeping and shushing and humming and buzzing of the machines that surrounded them. I listened until my head hurt and my eyes stung with all the tears. I was too empty to cry. Rocket watched me and Samson intently, keeping his eye on us for Mama while she was in the hallway with Fish and Gypsy. Grandpa Bamba dropped into a chair at the foot of Papa's bed, looking forlorn and older than old. Then I leaned over Papa's bed with enormous care and whispered in his ear, Listen to me now, Papa. It's time for you to hear my voice inside your head. You may think you've got no savvy, Papa, but you're wrong. You do have a savvy, you do. I thought back to everything I knew about Papa. I thought back to the story of how he'd met and courted Mama, 
never giving up until she finally agreed to marry him. Even after Aunt Dinah had told him to shove off, I thought back to the world's largest porch swing and how Papa always vowed that he'd build us one of all our own. I remembered Papa coming home from work late because he had been determined to pick out the very best special occasion dress that he could find. You do have a sappy, Papa. You do, I repeated over and over in his ear. You never give up, Papa. Not ever. That's your savvy. You never, ever give up. I closed my eyes and made a wish, a belated birthday wish in my imagination. I wished that Papa could hear me. I wished that Papa would listen. Then I bent down and kissed Papa's forehead. Give up said a faint, faint voice inside my head. I opened my eyes. Samson's hand rested lightly on Papa's shoulder. Don't give up. The voice came again, a little louder now. I looked at Samson. I wasn't sure I'd even seen my little brother cry before. He'd always hidden everything away so well, but he was crying now, making neither a sob nor a sound. The biggest, quietest tears slid down Samson's face to fall and fall like fish's rain onto Papa's chest. Maybe it was Samson or my words or my wish or a miracle, or maybe it was the same for Papa as it had been for my brother's dead pet turtle. Maybe nature was only doing what nature does, and it was simply Papa's time to start healing and waking up. We could never really know. Even with the savvy, some things always stay a mystery. Don't give up. Miss Mermaid shivered and swished her tail ever so slightly as though the effort was almost too great. I don't give up. The voice in my head was louder yet. Papa, I shouted, certain now that it wasn't just me hoping. The voice came from Papa and Miss Mermaid. Papa, that's right. You don't give up. Can you hear me, Papa? It's me, Mibs. Rocket put his hands on my shoulders and tried to quiet me, but I shook him off. Grandpa rose up out of his chair with a stern look. Papa, can you hear me? Don't give up. I shouted again. Mibs, stop yelling, said Rocket. This is a hospital. He can hear me, Rocket. I know he can, and I can hear him. Mibs, Papa's not even conscious. Rocket raised his own voice now, sounding tired and vexed. But I ignored him and kept yelling into Papa's ear. Mibs, shouted Rocket, trying again to pull me away from Papa. Without warning, all of Papa's buzzing, whirring, shushing machines and monitors went berserk. Lights flashed and alarms sounded. Sparks popped from the equipment and the up and down rhythm of the line on Papa's heart monitor went flat with a single terrifying tone. Rocket turned completely white. A horrified look contorted his face, and he began to back out of the room, bumping into Fish and Mama, who had heard all of the commotion and came running. They were followed in by the nurse in the rainbow scrubs. Everyone needs to clear this room immediately, said the nurse. No, I shouted. Papa needs me. I can hear him. Mibs, please, said Mama. I couldn't let them make me leave. I had to stay and listen to Papa. I had to let him know it was time for him to wake up and that I would be there where, when he did. I lowered my voice and leaned right up to Papa's ear again holding on tight to his bed and ignoring everyone who tried to pull me away. You are my good, sweet papa, and it's time for you to wake up and come home. It's time for you to come home and build us that porch swing so that we can sit and think and watch the clouds roll by together. Then I can tell you all about buses and kisses and voices and everything that happened while you were asleep. Don't give up, papa. Don't give up. More nurses flooded the room, and an orderly tried unsuccessfully to pry my fingers loose from Papa's bed while a doctor pushed his way through the crowd to check Papa's heart. Mibs? Yes, Papa, I'm here. I squeezed Papa's hand. He could hear me. Papa knew I was there. Mibs? I can hear you, Papa. It's Mibs. It's your little... I stopped myself before I could finish saying little girl. I didn't feel like a little girl anymore. I wasn't one. It's Mibs, Papa. I'm here. Papa's fingers twitched and his eyes fluttered open, making the doctor smile and Mama cry out. Rocket choked on his own tears and Fish whooped and hollered. Feeling Samson's hand in mine, I knew sure as sure as sure that everything, everything was going to turn out just fine.